Hi everybody, I'm Jack the Rambling Rack Intern. I hope that you're doing well. I hope you're having a great start to this week. I'd like to discuss Brand, or Brand by Henrik Ibsen, the first of his great plays according to many. A very fascinating work, a work filled with religious symbolism, uh, religious themes, questions. The titular character of Brand is a, is a Norwegian priest, and he is obsessively focused on this question of how can man be redeemed? That's the penultimate line of the play. And, uh, and that becomes a question for Bron, even if it's not necessarily the question for, uh, you know, we as, as readers or as an audience uh, for the play. Um, but it really is a fascinating work. And there is, this, there is this question of, you know, what is the true worship of the true God for, for Bron? He believes he's found an, a new path that is uh, unique and, and different from uh, the, perhaps the Norwegian church as a whole, uh, the villages that he's been passing through, his own home. Uh, and he f believes he's found a new path, and, and there's this sense that he needs to be uh, consistent in his worship of God at all times, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the tragedies, and the tragedies do pile up in this play, uh, sometimes in quite horrifying fashion. Uh, another key line, and probably the most famous line from the play, occurs at the very end of Act 4, where Bran says, Soul be steadfast to the end. The victory of victories is to lose everything. Only that which is lost remains eternal. And that, of course, is a sort of Ibsen's paraphrase and quote of uh, Jesus Christ in Matthew 10, verses 39 specifically, but even before that, where he goes, um, whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And before that, he had mentioned, you know, uh, whoever loves his uh, father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever will not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And then he ends with the whoever, you know, finds his life will lose it, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And that is specifically what is happening to Brand throughout this play. Um, the, the, those different events that Christ specifically mentions occur to Brand. Uh, the, there's even a sort of dark, dark, witty um, joke about taking up a cross in Act 5 at the end of the play. So it's suffused with religious symbolism. Um, but but it, it remains a fascinating play. The character of Bronn is, um, I, I think, is a very strong character, but probably uh, provokes a lot of negative visceral reactions uh, to modern readers, his, you know, in terms of sort of modern sensibilities. Uh, the, the character can feel not so much um, like an overstrider, like we see sometimes in Christopher Marlowe or other playwrights, uh, or... Um, even the, necessarily the villains that we find in Shakespeare, but he's a very powerful force nonetheless. Um, sometimes within Ibsen's plays, there is a sense, there, there's almost always a sense of energy in Ibsen's plays, even in plays that seem to be uh, more like social dramas like uh, Doll's House. Uh, still, the, the characters there, there's a sense of energy and urgency filling the characters where it seems like they're about to like burst out of those confines, social, um, moral, ethical, you know, whatever they are. Uh, but within Bronn, it, it's different. There's not just this energy, but there's this actual like fire raging around. And, and we see um, that, that sort of climactic, those climactic moments in plays like The Wild Duck or um, Ghosts or particularly Hedda Gabler, where that, that energy does burst into fire. Throughout Bronn, it feels like that there are storms and fires just raging in nearly every act. And I think it, it certainly... Um, it has a different and a unique energy uh, for Ibsen's works. But to explore, so we have, to sort of explore the play itself, we have uh, Brand, who is uh, a priest. He's um, trying, to, he believes he's found this new way of worship, and he's traveling through uh, sort of a, a set of hillsides and fjords where there are, um, you know, natural dangers. There's famously a, uh, a section where um, there's like a frozen lake, and uh, a cap of snow across a chasm that is referred to colloquially as the ice church and it has it's, it's enormous and grand but also terrifying and dangerous because an avalanche could occur at any point but on his way Bronn meets up with an old friend from his youth Einar and uh, Einar's love Agnes who uh, you know they, they claim to have been married without a priest or, or something um, but they're traveling and kind of passing by and so Bronn and Einar have this this question <clears throat> uh, around, you know, who is this God they worship? And uh, Einar replies, oh, I see, this is the new teaching. You're one of those pulpit thumpers who tell us that all joy is vanity and hope. The fear of hell will drive us into sackcloth. And Bron replies, 
No, I do not speak for the church. I hardly know if I'm a Christian. But I know that I am a man, and I know what it is that has drained away our spirit. And Einar, who usually have the reputation of being too full of spirit. You don't understand me. It isn't love of pleasure that is destroying us. It would be better if it were. Enjoy life if you will, but be consistent. Do it all the time, not one thing one day and another the next. Be holy what you are, not half and half. Everyone now is a little of everything, a little solemn on Sundays, a little respectful towards tradition, makes love to his wife after Saturday supper, because his father did the same, a little gay at feasts, a little lavish in giving promises. A little of everything, a little sin, a little virtue, a little good, a little evil. The one destroys the other, and every man is nothing. Um, and <laughs> so that becomes this, this focus, Brand, this, you know, all or nothing becomes this idea that Brand pushes throughout the play. Uh, he, at one, shortly after that, he's told, hey, there's a, a dying man. We need to cross this, this fjord during a storm to, you know, so a priest can, can tribe him. And Bron says, well, I'll do it. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll risk my life to do it. And the other character says, oh, and he goes, what, you, you would do all, any of these other things, but you won't risk your life? And they go, no, like, you know, I've got a family or no, I, that, the storm's too rough. And he goes, well, if you won't risk your life, you, it doesn't mean anything what you're risking. Um, and so he jumps in, and, and that inspires Agnes to leave Einar and follow Brand. Um, and, uh, and so there's, there's sort of our first event. But we also meet a, a critical character, which is Brand's mother. Um, and so when I mentioned earlier how Christ in uh, Matthew 10 references that whoever loves his mother or, or father more than me is not worthy of me, well, Bron very clearly rejects his mother, and he claims that it's around um, uh, her avarice and greed um, when he was younger. And uh, specifically, as she's dying, he says, if she'll give away all the money she, you know, hoarded and collected, then he'll come to her and sort of, you know, administer these last rites. And she's willing to give half and then nine tenths, and he keeps saying it's all or nothing. Um, and so that's sort of our first symbol that Bron is this obsessive individual who is, you know, I think to many modern readers unhealthy, but he continues uh, when he is um, he's told his son is dying, his child is dying, and that if you know if, if they don't move, then his you know his son probably can't last another winter um, in in this remote area. And Bron is thinking about leaving, but um, he's been told that the mayor has said, "Oh, now that you've inherited money." I know you'll leave and then everything can go back to normal. We won't have this you know, guy, guy shouting on the corner type thing. Um, and there is curiously a character, uh, uh, Gerd, who is um, believed to be a gypsy. And it turns out that uh, she and Bron have a unique relationship as well. Not by blood, but they do have a unique relationship where, um, you know, she sort of acts as this like prophetess when she can and has noted that he, she expects he'll leave as well. And so um, Brand ultimately, you know, when, when given this decision decides, no, he's gonna stay, he's gonna prove everybody wrong, he's gonna prove the crowd wrong, and he's gonna stay, even though he knows it will cost him his son's life. And he, there is that sense of um, Abraham being asked to sacrifice Isaac, and Brand believes him in himself the same way. Ibsen makes explicit references to those. So again, we have that reference to Matthew 10, where whoever loves his son or his daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Um, and Brahm believes he's like fulfilling these things um, through through his actions and through his worship that he is willing himself forward. Uh, and Agnes re reacts somewhat, you know, she's with him throughout this, but she reacts somewhat differently where she goes, it is easy to be strong in the storm, easy to live the warrior life, but to sit alone in silence, nursing one's grief, performing dull and humble tasks is harder. I am afraid to remember, yet I cannot forget. And so she achieves this deep emotional pathos um, within the play uh, that, that Bron doesn't quite achieve, I think. It's, it's a very, they, they diverge in a, in a critical way. Um, and so her, her portrayal is, is quite powerful, I think. Um, and then at the end of Act Four, as Bron has not only lost his son now, but he also, it has become clear that Agnes no longer really has, has a will to live through her grief and, and believes she will be dying soon. Um, that is when he has, she says, good night, thank you for everything, now I want to go to sleep. And she exits. 
and that is when Bran has his soul be steadfast to the end. The victory of victories is to lose everything. Only that which is lost remains eternal. And he really is a person who has lost so much at that point, and yet believes that he somehow has been consistent. Uh, he, has, he has maintained his all or nothing through to this point. Uh, and then we jump ahead six months, and uh, <laughs> this is where Bran is told that, you know, with his various works, with the building of this brand new church here, he's going to be given this this order of a great cross, he's this honor, and he just sort of darkly replies like, oh, I already have a cross. Again, that Matthew 10 reference. Um, and so Bran then realizes he's, that, that this, you know, a, a, a uh, provost from the church has arrived, the schoolmaster and sexton are there, the mayor's there, all these people are there and, and are sort of looking at Bronn as, as like, okay, well, here's how society needs to function. Like, here's, you, you've done the, you've got the people's attention, but here's how society has to function. Here's your role in it. And Bronn keeps pushing against that. And so he leads this crowd away from the brand new church they built. He, he like th locks it and throws the key away in the river. And he says, we have to go, we have to go. And so they go off into the mountains, into the snow. And initially they're following him, but then we get uh, this, this bit. He goes, you will be rewarded, my people, as surely as a God watches keen-eyed over this world. They, he prophesies, he prophesies. Someone says, tell us, priest, will the battle be hard? Will it be long? Will it be bloody? Another man says, well, we have to be brave. The schoolmaster, there's no question of our lives being in danger. What will be my share of the reward? My son will not die, will he, father? Will victory be ours by Tuesday? Uh, and Bron then suddenly realizes, wait a second, <laughs> this is not all or nothing. This is something, just make sure I get something back. He goes, what are you asking? What do you want to know? And they go, well, first, how long will we have to fight? Second, how much will it cost us? And third, what will be our reward? That is what you want to know? Yes, you didn't tell us. Then I shall tell you now. And they call, speak, speak, you know, prophesy the truth. Um, Bron, how long will you have to fight until you die? What will it cost everything you hold dear? Your reward, a new will, cleansed and strong. A new faith, integrity of spirit, a crown of thorns. That will be your reward. And the crowd goes, man, betrayed, you have betrayed us, you have tricked us. I have not betrayed or tricked you. You promised us victory. Now you ask for sacrifice. Um, and so Bron believes he's going to be the one, you know, and, and they, they, through his example, they are going to, you know, follow him on this all or nothing. And yet they don't. <laughs> and so the, the powers that be, of course, come back and they give some fraudulent lie about there's a bunch of fish in the sea. Come on, we're, we all gotta go get these fish now. We've been starving. Here's there's food. There's we can we sell the rest and there'll be money. Um, of course, references again to the apostles. Some of the apostles being fishermen, um, and the miracles that occur with Jesus allowing them to get enormous amounts of fish. And so they leave, and it, there's a quick dark line between the provost and Mary. Like, oh yeah, that was just a lie. Oh, I thought it was a miracle. No, it was just a lie. And they head down, and so Bron is now all alone. And right as they leave, they, they like throw rocks at him, they stone him. And so he goes, continues wandering off. He has a vision of what appears to be uh, Agnes, perhaps as a ghost, perhaps as an angel. Um, it's a very fascinating and, and strange scene uh, where she seems to like uh, tell him that everything is okay, but then remind him, him of the all or nothing. Um, and it is again, a very strange, fascinating scene. But then he runs into Gerd, who's sort of that um, part gypsy has been living outside of the confines of society. The very society he has been claiming needs to be redeemed because it's so flawed and messed up. And notice now both of them are outside of society alone out in the ice together. And so she sees him and is, you know, fascinated. Priest, you're limping. Your foot's hurt. How did that happen? The people hunted me. Your forehead is red. The people stoned me. Your voice used to be clear as song, now it creaks like leaves in autumn. Everything, everyone, what? Betrayed me. Now, who else was betrayed? <laughs> and so to, to really hammer this one down, ah, now I know who you are. I thought you were the priest. Fie upon him and all the others. You're the big man, the biggest of all. I used to think I was. Let me see your hands, my hands. They're scarred with nails. There's blood in your hair. 
the thorn's teeth have cut your forehead. You've been on the cross. My father told me it happened long ago and far away, but now I see he was deceiving me. I know you. You're the Savior man. Abraham says, get away from me. Shall I fall down at your feet and pray? Go. You gave the blood that will save us all. There are nail hands in your hands, nail holes in your hands. You are the chosen one. You are the greatest of all. And Ron says, I am the meanest thing that crawls on earth. And then it turns out, of course, that they are at, having rejected the, his, having torn down the old church, which is what he had been trying to do with the, the actual, the metaphorical church in society, and built this new one, and then rejecting that as well, they are now out in nature at the ice church, this ice cathedral in a sense. Um, and then an avalanche occurs. And as the snow comes down, uh, Bron like screams out, answer me God in the moment of death. If not by will, how can man be redeemed? And there's a voice cries through the thunder. He is the God of love. And so that really is this curious sense is, is in the, in that final act is having, you know, Bron seems to be a, a, uh, a sort of modern theophany, this appearance of, of Christ, but and that's certainly what Gerd, who as a as a sort of prophetess throughout the play, seems to be the one character who can see through things and, and understand things. So is Ibsen telling us that she is seeing that he actually is supposed to represent Christ um, in, in, a, in a sort of a, um, a very modern setting where a lot of writers did this. Faulkner did this with, uh, with World War I. Um, and, and other writers did this where they would try to and present, you know, Christ like, in the modern times, what would happen? And um, Faulkner kind of did that in Light in August with Joe Christmas as well. So the, is Ibsen doing that? Is Ibsen showing that Braun is a failure? Um, and that Braun's efforts to you know give all or nothing, having given all, having lost all, uh, does Braun achieve an apotheosis? Or is he you know buried in an avalanche because he's just a fool? And I don't know that Ibsen answers that question. Um, perhaps, perhaps he does, but I, I, I don't know. I don't know that he answers it definitively. Um, and so that, that final line that, you know, he is the God of love, what does that mean? Who did Brand love? Did he, he thought he loved God. Um, did he love some, you know, negative vision of himself? Did he, did he love Agnes? I do think he loved Agnes. Um, uh, and not just for himself, but I do think he loved Agnes. Uh, but, you know, it, it's curious, like, who did he love? And um, so, yeah, again, it's, it's a fascinating play. It's, it's a wild play. Um, Ibsen originally did not intend it to be uh, performed. It was really meant to be read. And you can see that. Some of the, the scenes just have these colossal <laughs> features that would be very hard to stage, but would be fascinating to see, of course. Um, now, this is one of his, in, in Ibsen's early plays are written in poetry. And this translation by Michael Myers is quite strong. It does leave out, um, there were cuts made apparently. There were various satirical references to the Schleswig-Holstein question, to the new, sort of neutrality of many of the Norwegians when uh, Denmark and Prussia were at war. And Ibsen's frustration with that, uh, even though he himself did not volunteer to fight with the Danes and said, well, I, I'm a poet, I have a higher duty. <laughs> um, so those, those cuts were made, but this is a translation by Michael Meyer and I really enjoyed it. I've read some other translations of Ibsen by Meyer and I've enjoyed those as well. In terms of other works, um, I had mentioned Hedda Gabler. There are some of Ibsen's plays I kind of group into sort of like marriage plays. Like I think Hedda Gabler to a certain extent is a marriage play um, and Doll's House certainly. And there are others that seem to be more like parent and child plays. and the various relationships that Brand has to his mother and then his own son um, and the death of his son do sort of put this in more of the parent-child play along with The Wild Duck, um, a play that I, I wasn't a huge fan of, but that may just be the subject matter of the play. Um, last year I read Ghosts, which was, you know, equally haunting um, for very different reasons. Uh, but within this same volume is When We Dead Wake, which is one of Ibsen's final plays. And a play that, to me, feels like a distillation of some of the ideas from Brand, with so the, some of the religious symbolism removed, but that sort of wild, you know, outdoors setting uh, retained. 
There are aspects of the play that definitely feel influenced by Soren Kierkegaard, uh, specifically Fear and Trembling. Um, that was the one that, that I was thinking of. I guess either or could have been sort of the, the all or nothing influence as well. Um, aspects of Iphigenia at Aulis by Euripides felt present. Along with, <laughs> this wasn't a reference, but another a parallel work would of course be Wise Blood by Flannery O'Connor where we have Hazel Motes and his, you know, uh, negative vision of the church <laughs> that he tries to create. And of course the the negative apotheosis he achieves at the end. Um, as Einer pointed out, some aspects of the play fascinatingly feel so um, analogous to the um, Christian movements within the United States during both the First and Second Great Awakenings, Jonathan Edwards being a, an excellent example of the First Great Awakening. And then the, the idea of Brand as sort of the last man standing um, and this all or nothing quest uh, certainly could be paralleled by the, the handful of birds that make it, you know, to find the Seymour in Attar's Conference of the Birds. So this is Brand by Ibsen. This will be my final maybe Midrash video for 2021. And I'm certainly very glad I've read the play. Let me know what your favorite play by Ibsen is if you've read Braun. Uh, if I was way off base in my interpretations, uh, please let me know. Um, but again, I hope everybody's having a great start to this week. Thanks.